So the WNBA has opted out of their current collective bargaining agreement, which was supposed to re-up in 2027, right? We knew this was going to happen. This is not a big surprise. I'm seeing some headlines and some content on YouTube. Like this is a big surprise. I saw one guy that was saying, I didn't watch the video. I looked at the headline, so maybe it's clickbait. But the premise was the WNBA is screwing itself because they're opting out. And I'm like, if you follow business and you know how this works, this was going to happen. With the influx, with the new media right deal, with the Caitlin Clark effect happening, everybody's revenue was up. Everybody's attendance is up. You strike while the iron is hot. And the big wigs on the other side of this knew it was coming. So they understand what they're dealing with. This is the prime situation that the women of the W want. They got some leverage now because they have a product that people are willing to pay to see. People got to calm down. They're not screwing themselves. They're not putting the cart before the horse or anything else that people are trying to say. It's not even like that. Everybody knew this was coming. And now it's time for the women of the WNBA to get paid. Caitlin Clark has a lot to do with this. She brought in the numbers. She brought in the visibility. Stop hating and stop acting like that is not the case. So for everybody in the W, we know you've been here for years. So get off that point. Stop coming back to that. We know that no, it is not all because of Caitlin Clark. But let's keep it 100. She's got a lot to do with it. Every league needs a superstar. It just so happens that Caitlin Clark was your most visible superstar. I did not say she was the best because for some reason, there are a lot of people, a lot of current fans and veteran fans in the WNBA, because you say that Caitlin Clark is a superstar, that just immediately means that she's the best player in the league. No, it doesn't. It just means that for whatever reason, when that girl came out of Iowa, she had the perfect recipe to get eyes on her. And it translated to the WNBA with the exception of Candace Parker. And I'm not going to go all the way back to when Cheryl Swoops and them started the league in 97, fresh off the Olympics and all of that, when Dawn Staley was there and, and Lisa Leslie and, and Lobo, all of them were playing. There was, there was no other distractions. There was no, no other place to go. So that was a different time and a different era. So leave that there. But now Asia Wilson is your best player in the league. Some people would argue Fee Collier. I would argue that too. But the point is not Fee Collier, not Asia Wilson, not Diana Taurasi, not Kelsey Plum, not Kelsey Mitchell, not Brittany Griner, not Arike Agumbawale, any of the big stars currently in the WNBA that have been in the league for like four and five years, they could not generate the numbers. They could not generate the interest that Caitlin Clark is doing right now. Caitlin Clark had the recipe. Call it what you want. Angel Reese has that recipe. Call it what you want. Everybody wants to compare and compare Caitlin and Angel. I still think Caitlin's profile as far as basketball goes is a little bit higher. Angel Reese with everything else she's got going on off the court and what she did on the court is adding up to a little bit more. But if you want to talk strictly basketball and who's putting butts in seats, you got to give the lion's share to Caitlin Clark. And guess what? Angel Reese is a damn close second. And both of them together have raised the visibility of the league. You can't deny that. Now they're opting out of the current collective bargaining agreement. They just signed this $2.2 billion deal over the next 11 years. That's going to be right around $240 million a year. When you were losing $25 million a year. And everybody's jumping to the conclusion because they put the numbers out. The WNBA is expected to, to lose 50 million this year, even with the revenues going up and stuff like that. Like y'all been paying attention. They knew this was going to happen. The reason why it's 50 million is because they had to get a $25 million deal for the private charter jets. Or it would have still been the same 20 to 25 million that they've been losing since its inception. It is not anything new. Now you got a situation with the new money coming in. When that check clears, you're going to have 240 million plus all of the other stuff that they're going to get. But that base salary is going to be there. So now probably in 2026, 27 will probably be the first year that the WNBA won't take a loss financially. My prediction was now that they're going to redo this deal, probably 2025, they're going to break even 2026, they're probably going to make money. That's how I see it. I could be wrong. But everybody 
all the big wigs know, the owners, they know where it's going. They know they have what they need. Caitlin Clark is in place. People are coming to watch Caitlin Clark. People are coming to watch Angel Reese. And because of that, it's filtering over the side. Now Kelsey Plum is getting a lot of visibility. Brianna Stewart, Sabrina Ionescu, Fee Collier, Asia Wilson, all of these people that's been talking all of this stuff about they deserve it and they should have been getting the credit and all that. We get all of that. Now it's coming. So don't get mad the way that it's coming. We giving you a million dollar house. Don't get mad because you don't like who handed you the keys. That don't make sense. Play your position and make your paper. This is where it's going to happen in this new collective bargaining agreement. Don't get greedy. Get off this narrative that we were here first and it should have been like this. No, it shouldn't have been. Because if you want to look at it like with real business, you should have been closed up years ago. If it wasn't for the NBA subsidizing you, WNBA as a league probably would have folded years ago, probably a decade ago. At the very least, it would not have recovered after COVID. So all of the players and the WNBA reps calm down and please try to think clearly so you can navigate what's going to come to you. Yes, you deserve it, but you still got to be smart. And like I always been saying, you are mainstream now. So when you are mainstream, you got to play the game and the game ain't fair. You most likely might not get everything you want in the new CBA, but now you got leverage. Now you got tickets. Now you got receipts. Now you got viewership. Y'all are on par with the NFL. It's not too many other professional leagues that can say that. The NFL is, is surely the king, but you giving him a good run for his money. And nobody expected that. The playoffs, the viewership was up. No, it was not as high as it was when Caitlin Clark was in it. We know that. But as a whole, it was up. It was better than it was last year. So the, the world didn't end because Caitlin Clark wasn't in the finals. And I'm saying that as a Caitlin Clark fan, because I saw that narrative floating around and I'm like, that's some bullshit. So all the WNBA reps got to do is think clearly, understand what you want as a group and go forward, plan your work and work your plan. That's what you got to do. Let me bring you in on this. All right. These are the key priorities for negotiation. Number one, a new economic model. Yes, they want to get paid. Transforming the, court, the current system, which imposes arbitrary and restrictive caps on the value and benefits players receive by introducing equity-based model that grows and evolves in steps with the league's business success. So basically what that is saying is, as I am interpreting it, as uh, when the league grows, so does our pay. That's fair. We make you more money. We, we deserve more money. Player salaries, establishing clear distinction between salary, bonus, ensuring players receive wages that properly reflect their value and contributions to the league's growing business. Okay, this might get a little spicy because now you're talking about based on how a, a player plays. Basically, the big thing here is how the bonuses are going to be divvied out. So there's going to be more incentives given out in contracts. I just think that the teams didn't make enough money to give out incentives, very similar to what the NFL does. They'll put that at the back end of contracts, like say, hey, we'll give you an extra million if you can lead the league in rushing this year. Stuff that's out of the realm of ordinary, but if a player does it, they'll give it up. But again, you got to play the game and the game ain't fair. There have been plenty of times, and you can go back and look it up, where you might have a player that is very close, 100 yards away from receiving a million dollar bonus because he passed a thousand yards and the owners will call down and say, take him out of the game so we don't have to pay him that bonus. They don't play fair. So that's what you're getting into. I like the bonuses, but you got to understand the game you about to play. Minimum professional standards, implementing consistent minimum standards that align with other leading professional sports league, maintaining professional and safe environments across the league, including practice, game facilities, as well as travel accommodations. Again, this is another one that's going to be a little bit tricky. Are you going to spend extra money for security, for travel, for uh, amenities and where you guys are staying, accommodations? Because if you do, that's going to take away from the big thing, the player salaries. Yes, you got a bonus and money coming in, but you still have a finite pool of cash. So everywhere you move that cash somewhere else, it's taken from somewhere else. So just be aware of that. So if you want the accommodations and everything, you can't always 
uh, look at what the NBA is getting because the NBA is making a bajillion dollars a year and you're not. So I know you want to go to a five-star restaurant, but you got a barbecue budget. So now you just got an influx of cash, spend it wisely. This is where you got to make those decisions. Retirement benefits, that's another one. Expanding retirement benefits to provide greater financial security and health benefits to players for their life after basketball. That is probably going to get pushed down to the bottom. That's going to get pushed down to the bottom because that's going to take some time moving forward. After Caitlin Clark's been in the league three, four years, is the, is the popularity going to go down? Is Juju Watkins going to take over or some of these other upcoming stars? We'll see how that works out. Uh, pregnancy, family planning. That's another thing that we as men don't really look at. Women do. So it'll be interesting to see how all of this money is divvied out. What is going to get the lion's share of the attention? Because you can't give all five of these things all of the attention. Now, one of the things that's not mentioned in this, and maybe you can put that under the new economic model is what's going to happen with all of the players playing in Europe. Look at the situation with Gabby Williams and her gripe with the league because they screwed her out of a year. So how's that going to come into play? What's going to happen when you're talking about unrivaled? But guess what? If you play playing unrivaled, if you're playing in Europe, you can still get hurt. So are they going to secure stuff like that? That might go under retirement benefits or medical. Medical's not even on here. Would they, would they put that under their family planning benefits? A lot of other things that these five don't cover for these women. But now they have some bargaining room. They got, they got some leverage. And I tell you what, let's just look at, this is, just to give you an example, this is the leverage that the WNBA has right now. 2024, look at the average attendance of the games. 16. Now you're looking at 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 9, 8, seven. So the lowest was the Atlanta dream at seven. There's years in the past where the Atlanta dream was at the top with average attendance. Let's go back to 2023. Now to mind you, this is average attendance, all the games, eight Las Vegas aces averaged 8,000. The highest was 17,000. Was that when they was in the finals? I would think so. Phoenix Mercury, 17,000, but they averaged eight Seattle storm. They only averaged seven. New York Liberty, seven. Again, let's go back to 2024. Look how they jump. Look how they jump. You know why. Stop playing and stop ignoring like it didn't happen. You know why. Go back. Let's go back a little bit more. Let's go back to 2015. Status quo. Consistency. Phoenix Mercury. They averaged a little over eight. Minnesota, eight. Los Angeles Sparks, eight. But look at the highs. Now, interesting enough, Phoenix Mercury, the 12. Uh, is that because of their facility? Uh, Minnesota Lynx, 17. 19 by the LA Spark. 18 by the New York Liberty. 17 by the Mystics. 17 by Seattle. 12 by Indiana. But they averaged seven. Now this is going, we're going back to 2015. Was that the last time Indiana was in the playoffs? So this is back when San Antonio and Tulsa, they averaged six apiece. Connecticut only averaged six. But look at the high, the, the, the highs. And also you got to remember the highs mean any game. If they went to Minnesota and Minnesota got seven, 17,000, they get credit for that. But if you look at the home games, now you're looking at a different story. Home game, San Antonio was four. Let's go back up to 20, let's go 2020. Let's stay in the 2020. But this was after COVID, right? So let's go to 2022. Seattle Storm had the highest average for home games at 10,000. Phoenix Mercury has seven, little under eight. Minnesota, almost seven and a half. Chicago, little over seven. Connecticut, five and a half. Los Angeles, five and a half. Las Vegas, little over five and a half, average, average. And they peaked out at 10,000. So I, I'm just saying all of this just to show the leverage that the league has now because the numbers are going up. And when the numbers go up, the money goes up. All of the, the highest viewed and the, the, I think the highest viewed games, Caitlin Clark was in 20 of them, 20 out of 23. So again, stop acting like it didn't happen. Stop acting like she's not the main catalyst for it. She's not the only catalyst, but she is the main catalyst because you can see that when she wasn't playing games. 
So stop messing with the money. Get your thoughts together on what you want to do as a league and go make that paper. Stop the nonsense. Stop all of the rhetoric about we was here first and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, we know all of that. But now you making money. Concentrate on how you making money. We don't care who was here first. You do. The new fans that are coming in, that's spending all of that money, eventually they're going to find out about all of these great players you've been talking about. The problem is it does look like you're jealous because now it's happening and you're not in the forefront anymore. That's just the way the game is played. I talk with other guys that used to play in the NFL and we say the same thing. Man, if I was in this league now with the money they making and technology and the health practices and all of that time, we had that same conversation and it's the same way in every league. Now it's your turn, WNBA. If you missed your opportunity, that's the way it goes. Pass the baton to these young bucks coming up and let the league continue. That's the best way to do it. Now you are in a situation where you can make the money that you have been saying you deserved all of these years. But don't get mad because you might not be a part of the process for long. That's just the way that it goes.